Hey everyone, I know this is our first episode since we did our little fundraiser, and we'll be definitely providing updates soon, so thank you for sticking with us, and we hope you enjoyed this interview. Thanks, guys. Hi, and welcome back to the Small Business Experience. Today we have our fourth interview. We have Justin Bartolomucci, financial advisor for Edward Jones. Dan, how are you doing today? Hello, Justin. Thank you so much for coming on today. We're excited to talk to you a little bit. Uh, we always start these interviews off with just letting the... The interviewee bring us up to present day with their life, where they were, and how they got there, and then we start from there. Yeah, sure. I mean, thanks for having me on, guys. So, I guess um, you want to know, like, kind of my whole life story. Right? Yeah, yeah. Give us, the, give us the, the <laughs> start year one. Give us summer <laughs> year, year two. One. So, no, I'd say probably to summarize quickly how where I, how I got here is you know, I started my. Uh, career as a financial advisor in Pittsburgh, right? Mm-hmm. Working for Edward Jones. Edward Jones is the only firm I've ever worked for. Mm-hmm. And uh, I rotated through a program that was in St. Louis after I, re- I relocated from Pittsburgh to St. Louis. And I rotated through a program that was like a leadership development program mm-hmm. um, that's popular for financial firms to have these types of programs where they kind of cherry pick talent from the field, generally younger people, put them through these training programs and it kind of reintroduced them back into field roles. And when I got reintroduced into my field role, which seems like yesterday, but it was actually around this time in 2010, uh, I moved to Collegeville here, mm-hmm. uh, sight unseen. <laughs> I'd never been to Collegeville before. Yeah. Uh, Just I, got knew that, I knew that it was close to Philadelphia. Okay, yeah. Right? And being from Pittsburgh, I'm like, okay, well, that's at least in the same state. And so me and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, moved to Collegeville kind of spontaneously to start a business in a town that I'd never been to and I didn't know anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it worked out well. You're still here. So far, so good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, you like uh, the area? You like Philadelphia? You know, I really do and uh, uh, hopefully my Pittsburgh friends don't see this because, <laughs> you know, I'd say Philadelphia is, is better in Pittsburgh in a lot of ways. Right? Oh. Uh, mainly just ge- geographically, right? You've yeah. got the mountains are, you know, an hour or two away. You've got the beaches are an hour or two away. You're mm-hmm. close to New York City. You're close to Washington City and Baltimore. I mean, anything you're looking for, you can find in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, right? definitely. And uh, Philadelphia is also a lot bigger city than Pittsburgh is, right? So Philadelphia's got, what, like 2 million people or so that live in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, Pittsburgh only has like 400,000 or so by yeah. comparison. So there's a lot more opportunity out here uh, for business. Yeah. And um, you know, so moving to a bigger city than at least definitely the one I grew up in mm-hmm. uh, has turned out to be kind of cool. Yeah. Right? I think it's funny the way people describe Pennsylvania is it's like Philly, Pittsburgh, and then like everything in between you can just skip over. Yeah. Like it's like really not all that important. That's just turnpike. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You just drive through it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, let me jump in for a second. Right. Yeah, uh, okay. J- Justin undersold himself a little bit. So you're a super, obviously super qualified. You went to the University of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Wake, you have accreditations from Wake Forest and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you hold your CFP, your CIMA. Uh, sep- series 63 and 7? Yeah. Okay. So he's all the accreditations, right? So I mean, if you want to talk to a little bit about what is that like to go through the process of receiving accreditations for this field? Because the CPA field or the accounting field and all this stuff is all driven professional designations. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, and professional designations just in general seem to be getting more and more popular, right? Yeah. At the, in the financial world, we kind of have developed an accreditation for anything. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's so, so many acronyms. There's so many acronyms out there. And so a lot, of them, uh, a lot of them are pretty meaningful, right? Like CPAs, CFPs, CFAs, right? They're ones that are pretty recognizable, pretty hard to get. And, uh, you know, come with them other obligations of, like, you know, putting your client's interest first mm-hmm. and CE obligations and things like that. And then there's a whole host of other ones that you can kind of get, you know, pretty easily and don't really mean a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but might help if you're trying to establish, like, a niche in a field or something like that. So, you know, getting all of the accreditations is an important part, especially, you know, being younger in the industry. I was 22 when I started as a financial advisor. And I tell you that you know, when you're trying to give people financial advice when you're 22, uh, it just doesn't. You just don't have as much credibility, yeah. right? And uh, interestingly enough, you can't. You know, you can't buy credibility and experience. Um, you can gain it over time, right? Yeah. Uh, but you can kind of demonstrate it via education, right? Yeah. 
So I knew that, hey, I had a bachelor's degree from University of Pittsburgh, which is a good university. Uh, but I knew that if I wanted to inspire trust and confidence in clients, right, and what we're thinking about hiring me to be their family's advisor, uh, I needed to have demonstrated that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, yeah, I worked for a big firm that's got a great, good reputation. And you know, if I meet with a client, I they seem like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, if you have <laughs> accreditations from you know, re- reputable third parties, that at least be like, hey, well, you know, Justin actually did a lot of studying and passed some pretty hard exams to right. prove that he actually knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, that gives clients a lot more confidence when they're you know, picking their financial advisor or dentist or CPA or anybody. Right, <laughs> right. yeah. You hope Absolutely. That, that person has at least had some you know, formal education in the, time <laughs> yeah. of the subject. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, you know, when I describe the accreditations, uh, you know, financial advisors have a bunch of them, but, you know, the CFP or being a CFP is pretty broad, right? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a, You study a lot of different topics, uh, everything from, you know, uh, taxes, you study estate planning, investment management, of course, is one of them. Uh, employee benefits, insurance, right? So it covers really like the full scope of the things that can face a family in terms of their financial affairs. Uh, but it's not very deep in any particular topic, right? Mm-hmm. So it's very broad, but not very deep in any particular area. The CIMA is an accreditation mainly in like asset management, or like investment management, mm-hmm. right? And that is very deep in that particular topic, which is make most of what I do, mm-hmm. right? which is, you know, I help people make financial plans. To help them manage their investments. Um, other people have, you know, we, as financial advisors, we don't technically specialize, right? Uh, but we have do kind of find like niches, right? Mm-hmm. right? Other financial advisors might be really good at insurance. Other ones might be really great at estate planning. Mine is uh, managing investments, so that's why I have those two kind of combined. So I know I know a lot about a little bit about a lot of things, mm-hmm. but I'm also very very deep in knowledge in that particular area. Right. So did you find that, um, you talk about kind of getting that like reputability with a client Mm -hmm. through those accreditations. Yeah. Did you find that you more so started out without them and then through experience realized that you wanted to have them to receive that reputability or all along you knew you were pursuing those from this, from kind of the get go? Yeah. So from the get go, I knew that they were eventually going to be a necessity. Okay. Um, to qualify to carry CFP March, you have to have at least three years of work experience, like working for clients, right? Mm-hmm. So no matter who, one, like if you start your career, you're going to go through the couple, first couple of years without any accreditations, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's definitely a little bit of an uphill climb. But once you, once you can get the accreditations, that really helps, goes a long way in just demonstrating your credibility and, and your trustworthiness and mm-hmm. people tend to you know, if you're looking for a financial advisor and someone has a CFP and someone doesn't, even if you interview both, you're probably going to lean toward the one that has demonstrated uh, more expertise, right? So right, it makes sense. Yeah. It's the expertise. same thing of like continuing education. It's a big in the professional field, like the professional yeah. designation fields. Um, so I guess we have a mix of people who are watching these videos mm-hmm. and listening on podcasts. Uh, like some of them are people who are maybe looking for financial advisors or other people are getting into a new career or like deciding they might want to become a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. So if you were talking to the second group of people, Mm -hmm. what is it, like what's the price to entry to become a financial advisor or now they're saying financial professional. Mm -hmm. So what, Mm -hmm. what's that step in that process? If you could lead people who maybe are listening for that reason. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're looking to break into the industry as a financial advisor, uh, the barriers to entry are actually really low, right? Um, you don't need to go to like law school, right? Or get Mm -hmm. some fancy degree technically to get a series seven license to be a, a, you know, broker dealer or to have a series 63 is like your 65. I think they do now as an investment advisor. Technically, you don't even have to have a college education. Right? Okay. I mean, you could be high school educated and sit for and pass these exams. Right. Mm-hmm. Now the exams are pretty tough. Right. So I mean, there you don't you can't you can't be uh, not intelligent and pass them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can pass the exams and you can get licensed to do business as a financial advisor, and then comes the process of like every financial advisor effectively plugs into a bigger organization for resources. Mm-hmm. Um, I plug in Edward Jones. But you can see there's a variety of companies out there 
and usually you'll start with one of them, right? And you're talking about when you plug in, you're talking about the broker-dealer, is that right? Yeah, so broker-dealer, custodian, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Edward Jones is a broker-dealer and a custodian. A clearinghouse. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. You know, there's the Merrill Lynch's and Warren Sam's of the world, like the big wire house as well as Fargo. And then there's mm -hmm. smaller ones like uh, Charles Schwab. Well, Charles Schwab is big, but they're, they're popular in like different spaces. Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade. Um, they'll do custodians and the broker mm -hmm. dealers and there's a lot of people in the marketplace uh, but yeah so once you get once you get licensed you have to be sponsored by a firm to get licensed so it's really you know you're going through the interview process you're trying to figure out uh, what firm is really kind of has the business model that fits you and the type of practice that you kind of envision running and then um, you know they're also looking too for candidates who they think are going to be able to run a successful business in the future. Mm. It's, a, it's a for financial firms. Financial advisors are kind of a big upfront investment, uh, and you're, they're generally not profitable for years down the road. Yeah. So the selection criteria is pretty uh, tough to get through a lot of times, especially for you know a lot of the bigger firms who are paying you salary support and stuff like that. Uh, you know they're looking for people who are. The in right, have in it for the long haul. Yeah, who, are, who really are looking for that career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's a good characteristic when you talk about a financial advisor, even for the firm who's sponsoring them, but also for the client that they bring on. Mm -hmm. Like if you're bringing on a client as a financial advisor, they want to make sure you're going to be there when they retire. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's very important too. Yeah, that's one of the things I talk about with, my, with many of my clients now. There's this funny tendency, financial advisor, your client base tends to be average age of your client base tends to be about like 25 years older than you are right mm -hmm. in that range uh, which is kind of perfect timing right so my clients are either mostly are newly retired or about mm -hmm. to retire now right uh, so I'll be their financial advisor for the rest of their life mm -hmm. likely right because right. I have the whole rest of my career mostly to work right mm -hmm. my financial advisor told me I gotta do this for like the next 25 or 30 years <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to be around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and that's what clients want to hear because they don't like going through the process of interviewing people to be their financial advisor. It's not yeah. an easy process. And also, segueing into, like, the trust that it takes to become one, mm -hmm. you have to put a lot of that, like, the designations and the years of experience and the training mm -hmm. to become that trusted person for them. And once you find someone you trust, as long as they're doing a great job, you don't want to... Go search for someone else. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So that's that's definitely one of the you know hurdles of being a new person, right? Uh, but also one of the benefits of having been around for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. Is that financial clients for financial advisors tend to be pretty sticky, because mm -hmm. as you just mentioned, it's kind of a hassle to change. Yeah. Right, and also it's kind of a risk to change because you don't know what well, was the next person, you know, what are they going to do? You know, it's kind of that sight unseen. So you're right. When you find something that works. And you're satisfied with it it's it's usually what you're sticking with you know? yeah we talk a, a little bit about before we started recording but kind of the relationship you said between like for you and edward jones and yourself so kind mm -hmm. of like the advisor mm -hmm. to the yeah. firm itself Can you speak a little bit about that yeah so you know you, you guys had that in like the list of questions you're going to ask me and i thought about that one a lot because financial advisors all financial advisors have kind of a complicated relationship with their employers mm -hmm. right um, so on one side of the spectrum, there's, you know, the wirehouses, which is like Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, right? And uh, the, all the advisors who work for there are, are employees of those firms, right? And then the, all the other, and, and those firms offer them like a lot of support, right? So it's really like on the spectrum of wherever a financial advisor chooses to kind of plug into that bigger entity, it's really going to dictate like how much support and resources those entities provide them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, all the way on the other side are like true independent financial advisors that might plug into independent custodians like Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade, um, but they're going to offer them like really just kind of a place to do business in terms of like a place to you know have your client assets custodied because mm -hmm. they have to be custodied with a third party because that kind of prevents a lot of like the bad things that happen in the financial world like right. for people stealing money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those third party custodians protect the client base, right? Mm -hmm. um, but might not offer like any support. Like no, they're not going to offer you resources, they're not going to help you with office space, they're not going to help you with training, or compliance, or HR, they're not going to do anything of that. 
and then there's a lot of spaces in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. Edward Jones is probably in the, more in the middle, but maybe leans a little bit more towards the hybrid or to the wirehouse side of it. So technically, like the relationship I have with Edward Jones is I'm technically, when it breaks down, I'm an employee of Edward Jones, right? But I also have my practice that runs its own P&L, which pretty much is the way I get paid. Mm -hmm. right? So I effectively run like my own little branch of Edward Jones, like my own little practice of Edward Jones underneath like their umbrella. Right, uh, and for that, Edward Jones gives me resources in terms of you know I have analyst support and I've got uh, you know HR and compliance and they pay for my office space and they pay for my staff some of that right and they cover like tech, some like technology costs and things mm -hmm. like that. They're effectively like an investor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they paid me a salary when I was getting started, right? So I wasn't like eating you know, ramen noodles all the time. And That's they, good. <laughs> yeah, so they kind of were like my early investor. I partnered with them, right? They, you know, they had the money and resources, mm -hmm. and I was willing to do the work, right? Gotcha. So we partnered up yep. and together now, down the road, on my, on my P&L, I share my profits, right, with Edward Jones. Effectively, it's like my partner, mm -hmm. right? And so we split it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty much how, like, my relationship with Edward Jones is, uh, which is a little bit more unique than, like, an like, I'm not quite an employee, but I'm also not quite self-employed either. Right? Yeah. It's like a little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of an interesting thing that exists in the financial industry. Yeah, so there's not a lot of oversight from an Edward Jones perspective. It's just they put out the initial outlay of capital in you and invested in you mm -hmm. as a person, and then now you're kind of returning that investment over time. Yeah, from a, from like the business perspective. Now, of course, like they've got like compliance oversight and HR oversight, like those functions, like they, they have all that oversight because mm -hmm. they need to, right? They want to mm -hmm. make sure that our business is operating compliantly. There's a lot of regulations in our industry. So yeah. everyone has to have some type of compliance support. Edward Jones provides that for me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, from like a business perspective, yeah, like they're like, okay, we, we'll put out the money and they also offer me a lot of training and resources right, mm -hmm. to get started. And um, they offer me, I still do training with Edward Jones now. Mm -hmm. And uh, in return for that, right, is I share my profits with them, right? That's like the deal we made. So with like, you mentioned kind of on this spectrum of the support you're given based on what type of um, firm you work with or for, however you want to explain mm -hmm. it. Uh, so like say you're working with the Wells Fargo's of the world where you say they probably have a little more support than like an Edward Jones or a Charles Schwab, which has a little bit less. Yeah. What is like, so if you go with a Charles Schwab, are you keeping more profits because you're not yeah. getting as much? Yeah. Is that the idea? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'd say, so imagine you're starting out new in the industry right now, like you're brand new, you don't have any clients, you don't have, you know, you don't have any training, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you partner up with Charles Schwab as a custodian, gives you kind of this portal to do business with your clients, but you got to pay for everything, right? Mm -hmm. You got, like, you're earning no salary, you got to pay all your expenses, if you hire someone, you got to pay them, you want office space, you got to pay that. Uh, and Charles Schwab or their custodian is still going to take like a portion of their profits. It's just going to be a lot less. Gotcha. Right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas like when I partner with Ever Jones, we get my business. Like okay, we're going to give you the salary, but we're also going to teach you how to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like a franchise almost. In a I was going to say, right? is it? It's sort of the. I mean, obviously, it's a lot more sophisticated, but kind of like the McDonald's model almost. Yeah. Right. And so they're going to help you get started and then support you so that you become. A profitable entity right? mm -hmm. and then they want me to be as successful as I can be right because of yep. course we share in the profits yeah right? uh, so they're they have a very significant vested interest in that yeah uh, but technically I do fall on a, as an employee right Ever Jones is a partnership um, I'm a limited partner of the firm mm -hmm. but uh, all the employees of Ever Jones partners and limited partners or regular associates uh, we're all technically employees of the company mm -hmm. but we run like our own little businesses inside of it yeah. yeah so as you talk about running that small business when you are bringing in assistance or maybe people to help you out how do you manage that like that's all under your control right you're bringing in people um, so can you speak a little bit about how running that bit small business within this bigger company works yeah so um, you know I've got Cause you got some great people working for you we've met them. yeah they're, like they're really nice people yeah so I've got so, so I've, I've got my primary assistant who's Colin who's been with me for eight years now I think or maybe nine just mm -hmm. celebrates their nine year anniversary um, and he's like my right hand man right mm -hmm. and I have had a couple other assistants who have rotated in right now I have Valerie um, and I, before her I had Kayla 
and they've all been great but some people will come in and do the job for a little while and then uh you know start a family and you know just the normal stuff that every business deals mm-hmm. with right um but yeah it's it's tough because you know when you're hiring especially in a small business uh with a client base you, you gotta be pretty selective about the people that you hire absolutely right because you know you're introducing them to your client base your clients not only trust me to be their financial advisor but they also trust me to supervise and lead all the people who work on my little team too, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, I mean that's an essential part of creating scale as any you know, professional needs, right? Mm-hmm. You know, take look like you go to the dentist office, right? Like it's not the dentist who's you know cleaning your teeth and checking you know, checking all that stuff, yeah. right? It's a dental hygienist. You might be with the dentist for five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Because they they, they just they, come in and say, yeah, I'm good. right? <laughs> so because they need that scale, right? Mm-hmm. And and to doctors, that's why doctors have nurses, right? Go to the doctor's office. It's not the doctor is taking your height and weight, checking your blood pressure, right? The nurse does that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have people in our industry effectively the same thing. Come, you know, other industries have paralegals, right? And look for lawyers. We have paraplanners. It's kind of like what Colin does, right? Mm-hmm. But he th- he's pretty much like my support person, and Valerie does that too. Uh, and they support me directly in the branch, pretty much to free mm-hmm. up more of my time to do what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right, I just want to make sure you're right. um, With client relationships obviously being a huge, huge piece of your business, um, what are some steps that you actively take or have learned over time that are really important with managing client relationships? Oh, man, that's a, I mean, that's a big question. Mm-hmm. Like, where do you start? I mean, I guess authenticity, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of helps establish that trust. It, it gets earned over time, right? Mm-hmm. Especially... I definitely notice, you know, when, when I'm first introduced to someone, if they're looking for their financial advisor, for a financial advisor, a lot of times they're very guarded, right? It's kind of this unique thing, and I talk about it a lot in my meetings, is that, you know, it's a weird thing our, our culturally in America, right? We share all different types of things about ourselves with each other. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, all areas of our personal life, right? We share with other people, sometimes even yeah. complete strangers, but we don't ever really talk about money. Right? Mm-hmm. In fact, we probably don't really talk about money with your closest family and friends, yeah. right? Um, so I kind of have this unique position where, like, I talk money all day, right? Mm-hmm. And also, yeah. I've got a front row seat to, you know, the personal financial affairs of a lot of pretty successful people. Um, so you learn a lot from that. But breaking down that initial barrier, someone comes in, you know, and they're kind of like sharing with you their, you know, financial baggage. Their diary. Almost. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right? It's a very intimate part of their life. Mm. Uh, you get to see things that are going good, things aren't going good. You also very much learn what's important to people, mm. right? Because people will spend their money on the things that are important to them. Uh, and also, too, you know, they feel vulnerable, so it's, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of, like, trust building that has to happen to make them feel comfortable sharing with you. Yeah. Uh, but over time, I mean, I clients become friends and friends become clients, right? Because mm. people share with me you know, intimate and personal goals and, and challenges that they're going through in their life. And I'm sincerely happy, happy when like the good things happen, right? Mm. And, I, and I'm also there for them too when bad things happen, right? Yeah. So just being that person in their life that it's like, hey, it's okay to share any, you know, those aspects that you might be dealing with uh, that you're probably not talking to anyone else about. Yeah. It's almost a no judgment zone. Yeah. It's like you... No, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, because you can say basically people will come to you in all sorts of situations. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've dealt with people who come in fantastic financially, some people who come in less than fantastic. Mm-hmm. They're basically bringing you where they are today. Yeah. And now your job is to make sure it's better in 10 years. Yeah. My job is to help them. Right? Mm-hmm. Which is one of the, the greatest parts about my job is that I get to help people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool, right? It's not like I'm just going to work and plugging away doing some meaningless activity all day. It's like, and I actually get to see the outcome of it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when they're sitting on the the beach in Miami when they're retired, all happy, yeah. they'll they'll send you a little postcard yeah, and say, like, "Justin, we wish you were here too." Yeah. When they achieve those goals, right? And you're like, when they retire, that's mm-hmm. always like a big celebrating moment. Yeah, the beach house, you know, or even sometimes just like hitting like uh, like when they when they find like when they find have a million dollars. Right. Mm, yeah. Um, that's like, I mean, that odometer going from you know six digits to seven. Mm-hmm. Like most people, that's only going to turn over one time in your life. Yeah. Right? If you're lucky. Right? Yeah. 
uh, if you're really lucky, like, <laughs> you might turn it over again. But yeah. you're gonna be, it's pretty rare. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, you got to celebrate those types of things. But no, no one else would, in their life would know that, right? It's mm-hmm. not like you're going to run around with like a sign. It's not a Facebook update. Guess what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not know, posting on social media. Like, you know, or, or even sometimes promotions and things like that. A lot of people, especially, you know, if things are going like really, really good for them, a lot, a lot of people feel uncomfortable sharing that. Stuff. 100%. Like, Especially with finances. Yeah, for some reason. Right? It's this taboo thing. It's a big culture, thing. Right? Yeah. But it's like, hey, like you can share that with me. Mm-hmm. Right? So people, people, like clients will call me when they get a big bonus. Right? Yeah. And they're like excited. You I'm can't excited. tell anyone else. Yeah, I'm excited for <laughs> too. Yeah. Because like besides maybe like their spouse, like who else do you get to share it with? Yeah. Yeah. It is super weird though. I, like I never, you don't really think about it, but you're super, like it's a very taboo thing for some reason mm-hmm. that People will talk about just about anything yeah. with you, right? With just with complete strangers occasionally, mm-hmm. like sitting in a bar. But one thing that never gets talked about is finances. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. how many uh, you, you guys are like CPA, right? Accountants. I mean, how many times do people get a little weird when you're like, "Oh, how much money do you make?" They're like, "Oh, why do you need to know that?" Yeah. They're like, well, that's kind of like the defining thing in this tax return. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <That's> um, <laughs> but you can tell, or if some people, I've had some people who be like, "Well, I don't want to use a CPA in the same town as me." I don't want them to, I don't want people in my community, especially like small towns. Mm-hmm. I don't want people in my community to like know my business. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's always been a private thing in our culture. So it takes a little bit of, you know, trust building to really get out of folks, you know. But once you get it, like once you're on that, once you are that trusted person in their life, um, that's a great spot to be because then you can really help them, right? Because yeah. then I get the chance to do the the fun part which is kind of help nudge people out of their comfort zone mm-hmm. right it's like mm-hmm. hey maybe I can help coach you to do some things that maybe you wouldn't have ordinarily done but you'll do it because you trust me mm-hmm. right? and those things are ultimately going to be good for you mm-hmm. right yeah but so, so I guess none of us sitting here well not guess none of us sitting here are psychologists no uh, Ian and I have been really interested in this new um, not new but new to us but uh, idea in this industry called behavioral finance Mm -hmm. okay so it's like I mean obviously you know there's accreditations that go along with that and um, like that approach to become financial advising can you talk a little bit about the financial like impact or how people will address their financial issues due to this behavioral finance phenomenon yeah no I'd love to I'd say if you uh, if you came to my office if you were a new client and you're you're flying the wall of my office and a new client came in and people ask People kind of wonder, like, what does a financial advisor do, mm-hmm. right? Um, and in movies don't really make, and TV doesn't really make good representation. <laughs> doesn't make it right? easier. <laughs> I know, they make it a little way cooler. <laughs> uh, but really, you know, people come in, I write what I call the, the wealth management equation. Mm-hmm. And it's wealth management equation, it's wealth management equals one part financial planning, one part investment management, one part tax management, and one big part, and I put making letters real big, BC, where it stands for behavioral coaching. So naturally, people are like, well, why? What's behavioral coaching? And, and I explain that, hey, money's taboo in our life. But I also explain, too, it's like, hey, you know, probably the biggest cliche is, you know, the market's crashing, and I talked you out of probably making like, some bad investment decisions at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, you know, that's probably like the biggest cliche out there that most recognizable is like, oh, the financial advisor helped coach their client off the ledge of making like a, doing irreparable harm to their portfolio. Right. Which is true, right? But, uh, but it goes way beyond that, right? I mean, everyone can look back in their life and either in their own life or certainly observed and other people in their life, people who haven't made like some great financial decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, guess what? Like bad financial decisions compound just like good financial decisions do, just like investment returns do, mm-hmm. right? So the biggest advantage that you kind of get as a financial advisor is that, like I kind of said, I have a front row seat to a couple hundred people right here in town pretty successful people and what I learned about them I learned the history of like well what how did they do it right? mm-hmm. where did they get here yeah they'll share with me and I'll observe even firsthand these things that went well things that didn't go well mm-hmm. right and over time not only do you learn to have a knowledge as a financial advisor but you also gain a lot of practical knowledge from your clients right? mm-hmm. if you learn from their experiences too and because of that I can help steer people around you know the things that would otherwise kind of they, they would make a mistake on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is people, we have kind of the ability to, like, talk our way into anything, right? Yeah. You probably experience this uh, 
you know, you ever have a friend who buys a fancy car, and uh, but but and you'll comment like, oh, it's a really nice car. And the first thing they'll say is like, oh, but let me tell you about this great deal I got. On. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? Let me ju- let me justify yeah. why I probably spent too much money on this car <laughs> and I got this fantastic deal I got. Or oh, I got a vacation house, but don't worry, I'm gonna rent it out. I'm gonna make all this money, right? I mean, you guys have heard the stories, mm. and I'd say. Most of the time, that's not the truth. Most of the time, is that they wanted it, right? Yeah. Which is fine, right? And I'm like, hey, you know, if you if you buy a nice car because you want a nice car, like you want a nice car, that's mm-hmm. fine. Uh, but as people, we can kind of talk ourselves into anything, right? Uh, and it's kind of my job is to help be that you know, other voice in the room, that objective voice in the room that sees the whole picture. Mm-hmm. That sometimes, you know, someone's like, hey, I'm thinking about doing something kind of fun, like buying a beach house. And sometimes I get to say, go for it. Right? Yeah. It's exciting. Your family's going to love it. Yep. You can afford it. It works to the plan. Do it. Right? Mm. Other times i got to say, hey, I don't know if I do that right now. Yeah. Right? It's kind of risky. It's going to put you on thin ice you know, financially. It's going to stretch you pretty far. You know, mm-hmm. you know, month to month. Like, you know, Think carefully about making a decision like that. Because otherwise, people just don't kind of really know where they stand. Right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They're just kind of guessing. Yeah. So you yeah. deploy a lot of self-awareness. Yeah. Like a lot of just... This maybe for people who uh, at no fault of their own maybe don't do it themselves. It's like you're the self awareness check. Yeah, <laughs> like the extra check for them when they're going through that stuff. It's got to be tough though, having a big part of your job being saying no to people. But I guess it's part of your responsibility as their financial advisor. It's part of the gig, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd say uh, you know rather when someone's trying to make t- trying to tell me what a great deal this. Probably not a great financial decision. <laughs> the more uh, they talk about it, the yeah, more right? you're probably like, okay. They're excited. They get down there on the phone. They got their pitch ready to come out. Know? And a lot of times, you know, I'll start asking some questions because I want to learn more, right? Mm. Uh, but also, too, if, if, I'm, if I'm, you know, doing some of the math and I'm measuring that, like, hey, maybe, maybe this isn't really the right direction, I'll start to just highlight some of the risks, right? Mm. Just like, hey, you know, that's, uh, I noticed if I combine this with your current mortgage, you're, you're paying, like, 50% of your income just on these two mortgages. Mm-hmm. It doesn't leave a lot of money for, for other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You know, have you thought about that? Or, well, you know, I know that, uh, you know, maybe your, maybe their spouse is, has like a side gig and they're making some income and I'm like, hey, I know that's good right now, but like, what if that dries up, right? Or what if you lose your job? Because, you know, you got some money in emergency funds, but you know, I had another mortgage, beach house mortgage on top of that too and you know, it's going to dry up pretty fast and, you know, then you're, forced to sell one of them or something right or take mm-hmm. money out of your retirement accounts and have you you're just going to be on thin ice and you know is that what you kind of are you okay with that mm-hmm. and a lot of times when you're uh, kind of just highlighting some of those pieces of it they start to say guess themselves mm-hmm. yeah so like you know what now that you mention it you know i'd say most people tend to prioritize financial security in their life over yeah like other things financially like the first box you want to check is like do i feel financially secure and if someone's going to do something that's going to put that at risk, like bring that up. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, uh, that's enough for them to say, hey, you know, having a beach house isn't worth me being worried about it all the time. Yeah. Right? And then a lot of times I'll be like, but, you know, if that's a dream of yours, like, I, I'll tell you what we got to do to get there. Right. Right? But it's not something that you probably is just spontaneous yeah. commitment like that. A lot of times people, you know, Brett Br- mentioned the beach house thing because it's something that happens. People will go to the beach and they get excited. Right? Yeah. And then they meet these realtors or like, that. oh, they're building this new condo over here. Of course, and yeah. They've got, always got a great pitch and it's got a great deal. And they're like, can you envision yourself there? And you're like, we just had this fantastic week here. Um, but then, you know, once like kind of core has prevailed, a lot of mm-hmm. times people realize, actually, that's not exactly what I want. Mm. So rather than saying no, you almost find yourself... Walking them to the conclusion themselves. Yeah. Lay out the facts. Right? Like, do you yeah. really want this risk? Do you want this risk? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That kind of allows them to tell themselves. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, is that I'm just there to help them. Mm-hmm. Right? And, uh, but it's their money. Yeah. Right. right? So right. they get to decide. It's super helpful when clients are proactive. Yes. But I mean, we have clients and you have clients that are reactive mm-hmm. and they made this and now they're like, Justin, fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> because we have those people come in every year with uh, a tax problem mm-hmm. that we probably could have solved during the year with some tax planning mm-hmm. and some whatever. But then we have those clients who, who don't, who don't want to call ahead. Yeah. And we still do our absolute best as much as we can. 
but um, there's definitely a difference between proactive and reactive clients and how you deal with them. Yeah, I mean, people will call me, have called me before, and they go, oh, I just retired and I need a financial advisor. And I'm like, well, I really hope this ends up. <laughs> <laughs> right? I hope the last guy did good. Yeah, right? Wow. So, That's really funny. Yeah. So uh, when you catch yourself in some of these situations where people are asking for more than maybe they can really afford or asking you to do too much, how do you... Like manage basically saying like I can't help you achieve that goal. Like there has to be scenarios where people are like I want this. And it's like with what's going on right now, we can't really attain that. You know, I'd say financial planning software is great in that way. That you know, all, all financial planning software is it's just like a really big algebra problem. Right? Mm-hmm. It's big and it's complicated, but it's solvable. And thank goodness there's software out there. I was gonna say I was never very good at algebra. I know, right? <laughs> but uh, so when you show people like okay, you know. This is the outcome that you're looking for. Maybe it's retire really early, right? Oh, I'm going to retire when I'm 55. It's like, okay, well, uh, then, like, these are the savings commitments that you'd have to make today. And they're like, whoa, that's crazy. And it's like, okay, well, you know, there's only really a few variables that we can adjust here. Right? Yeah. We, we could take more risk and maybe earn more money. Uh, you can save more money or you could spend less money uh, or you could die earlier. Right. <laughs> most, most people, These are your choices. Yeah, most people don't choose the last one, you know, in my experience. People go to some pretty extraordinary lengths to prolong their lives. So take that one off the table. You guys save more, spend less in, in retirement, or earn more. Yeah. And naturally, people a lot of times gravitate to the earn more because that's the one that hurts the least, right? Yeah. yeah. And, but it's like, hey, listen, I can't, I can't make stock markets do better than they do. Right? Yeah. And so, as with any model, you start monkeying around with the assumptions. I mean, I can say, okay, yeah, our investment returns are going to be great all the time, and inflation's yeah. going to be zero, and the government's not going to, you're not going to have to pay any taxes, and this money. You know, it's going to be great. Yeah, right? And it, and it looks fantastic. Great. Yeah. You're going to retire at 55, but that's why, you know, you have to have qualified professionals who hey, listen, like, you know, we can we can massage these assumptions, but eventually we're going to get to a point where this is not reason realistic yeah. mm-hmm. so the joke that I make a lot of times is like you know hey if you're gonna work with me I like I need your financial plan to work right mm-hmm. because if because if it doesn't then like you're gonna have to move in with me and that's gonna be awkward <laughs> and, uh, and then people kind of laugh at that but part of it's like hey listen that's the truth because like, if it says you're gonna run out of money when you're 70 like, what like, what are we gonna do yeah because uh, I, gotta, I gotta make it work Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So most most of your life is reeling in people, almost. Uh, a lot, you know. I'd say mo- you'd, you'd be surprised. Most people come in having pretty realistic expectations, mm-hmm. but, right? A lot of it's uh, you know they just want to see it, it outlined, want to make sure we have a plan and we're working that plan and that's being successful, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you probably just experienced. There's people in your life who are planners, and there's people in your life that kind of just like hope it happens right yeah um but i'd say hey you know, there's a quote that i've heard in the past that you know, hey if you just if you're just drifting down the stream you know hoping that you end up where you want to be uh that, that's not very good your odds are probably pretty low mm-hmm. but if you have a if you have a rudder and you can steer right and you have a map well then your odds of getting where you want to go are, are a lot higher yeah right? so it's not too terribly difficult that like you make a plan you accomplish a plan mm. we do this all the time in our business life there's there's not a business in the world where you're not planning like your goals and you're, and you're tracking your progress all the time right mm. particularly many of my clients are working for these big pharmaceutical companies and things like that I mean that's what they do all day in their professional life but in their personal life they just don't think about it right yeah. mm-hmm. so but they use those uh, quotes sometimes about like uh, the carpenter's house is falling apart. Yeah. Or the CPA didn't file his taxes on time. Yep. So I mean, that's an interesting thing too because whatever you're like really into in your life, sometimes mm-hmm. you let other areas fall. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have anything? Oh uh, yeah, I actually have a. This is more of like a personal. Just I just wonder about it when it comes to like the uh, like customer prospecting process. Mm-hmm. How does that work? Is it a lot of referral? Is it? Do you actively seek customers? Do you pitch customers? How does that really work? So I'd say it's it's different now 
right than it's ever been right and that's probably one of the hardest shifts that i've had to make in my business development process right mm-hmm. so i'd say first firstly the vast majority of my new clients come via referrals right okay um, but part of that is like i really try to create a referable practice right yeah and i um you know, especially the clients who I like, because like birds with feather flock together. I let them know that you know I'd be thrilled to help one of their family or friends if you know that ever came up. No pressure, but kind right. of just at least let them know like, hey, I, I'm I'm taking new clients, right? Because sometimes people be like, oh, I didn't even think you were taking new clients, right? Yeah. Um, but then in the past, I would do a lot of uh, business development like during social events, right? Mm-hmm. Clients would invite me to their Christmas party, or I you know host a like wine tasting or even just take a client the client's getting ready to retire has a birthday I take them to lunch and say hey invite a few of your friends right because uh, people talk right mm-hmm. well, we didn't get invited to the wine tasting yeah yeah sorry <laughs> must not have enough the, I gotta check my invitation <laughs> Evite got lost but uh, so I would do a lot of that and get a lot of introductions that way kind of stimulate introductions right because people mm-hmm. would talk to their friends and their neighbors and they'd be like oh I should see your financial advisor and you're like yeah here's this card you should definitely call him or sometimes they would not, you know, someone would ask them a colleague be like hey who do you use but go like, oh, it's Justin and they'd share their information mm-hmm. but for whatever reason like, that's just not the top of their priority list right then right, right? So I try to create these like kind of small and informal, fun social gatherings to, and I would invite people who would either tell me like, oh, sometimes people would tell me like, oh, hey, I gave your information to my neighbor Bob, right? Mm-hmm. And I would record that, right, in a, like my, my chat where I track it. And then if I was hosting an event that I knew my client liked, maybe it was golf or something like that, I'd be like, oh, we're gonna do this, you know, golf clinic, and I hey, tell you what, why don't you invite your neighbor Bob, right? Because your neighbor Bob. I know that you mentioned him to me. That might be a good way for me to meet Bob, right? Right. Uh, and then Bob, who might have been kind of interested in me as a financial advisor anyway, right, probably wasn't you know, ready to like, hey, let's have a meeting, right, because that's probably pretty low on his priority list. Yeah. But now it's like, oh, I get to meet him and do something fun too, or whether it's like going to lunch, maybe do something fun. Like, yeah, sure, I'll tag along. And mm-hmm. then they get a chance to meet me. I get a chance to meet them. It's pretty casual, it's social, right? Yeah. Uh, we're not really talking business there. But then, you know, at that thing, I would usually they would usually bring up like, oh, hey, you know, I've been meeting, having a meeting with you or something like that. I'm like, yeah, great. Why don't you? Uh, what's your cell phone number? Like, we'll connect next week and mm-hmm. set up the time. Yeah. And that was mainly how I grew my practice for years, right? Uh, very effectively. Now, of course, uh, you can't do that anymore, right? Because COVID, the whole restaurants are closed, mm-hmm. right? You can't. It's winter, so there's not as many activities that you can do. So I've uh, pivoted more to social media, right? So mm-hmm. I do, I'm a lot more active on social media now. I share a lot more content on social media. But I also um, try to find, you know, reach, I reach out to people on social media who meet in what I think is like my ideal client. Like mm-hmm. who is that person who I'm, I'm the best, I know who I'm the best suited to help. Right, mm-hmm. and if I look out into you know the marketplace, which can, you know, LinkedIn has just tons of ways to look for the filtered people or people right. that other people might know, I say, okay, who looks like one of those people, and then I'll reach out to them directly. Okay, um, but that's you know the effectiveness rate of that right now is pretty low because mm-hmm. uh, I think you got a lot of different headwinds right now between COVID, everything, and markets are doing good right now. So yeah. it's not a lot of catalyst for people to make a change but I'm like well I mean that's the only thing that I can do right now I don't spend a ton of time doing it mm-hmm. but I'm like I want to be active because I've got fixed costs that keep going up mm-hmm. and uh, the only way for me to manage those and keep my prices you know, really competitive is by growing right, right? Yeah. so you talk about um, we kind of think we talked about it a little bit earlier you talk about the scaling of the business. Mm-hmm. What is like that? Um, so you're obviously looking for clients still right now. Mm-hmm. And so what does that saturation point look like for you? Um, so for me, it would be like 200 households, right? Right okay. now I'm about like 160. All right. Um, so then once I reach 200, uh, I, that would be the, like I have the operational scale right now to get there. Mm-hmm. Once I'm there, it becomes a little bit, I'd have to figure out the next stage. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, the good news is is that I've got colleagues who work for Edward Jones who've already figured that out. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So once I'm there... There's blueprints. I can, yeah, there's blueprints. <laughs> I can tap some of those people. We have a great culture at our firm of sharing and you know helping out each other. 
So I've got a lot of people who I can, you know, try to gather some information from to mm-hmm. help me figure out the next stage of that. Uh, but also, you know, I enjoy the personal aspect of being a financial advisor. I don't have a need to scale up to be some, you know, huge enterprise or mm-hmm. to be like the, you know, best top advisor in the world. Mm-hmm. Right? I've got other things that I like doing in my life in addition to my job, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd be thrilled to just have those 200 great clients that I get to help all the time yeah uh, after that we'll see where it takes me right but I, I don't have some grand vision to be you know this huge business yeah mm-hmm. right? I think that lends itself nicely to somewhere I wanted to, to get to uh, intrinsic motivation mm-hmm. uh, especially when you're running a small firm uh, what inside it like there's different there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivations like yeah. does money su- like really fire you up at the end of the day is, is the relationships what inside your belly made you want to decide to run a small business and continue to push it forward mm-hmm. um, it's, it's fun right so I joked earlier I was like well I've got 25 years left to work probably right my financial advisor said um, but so what am I going to do coast it out for the next 25 years mm-hmm. these are going pretty good my business has done fantastic over the past 10 years I'm way ahead of where I ever dreamed I'd be yeah uh, and I'm extremely blessed with a fantastic client base I'm grateful right for the, for the chance that they gave me to help them but at the same time I'm like well uh, I can help more people right so that helps me motivate me um, also the people that work for me right they expect to get you know raises and bonuses and you know, they've mm-hmm. got goals too right sometimes I feel like I'm working for them <laughs> uh, but I'm like hey you know I think that it's fun I think someone's gonna have to figure it out in terms of to keep growing and uh, that's kind of my motivation right now but I've always been pretty self-motivated um, I've always been pretty competitive as a, just a person right uh, if you asked my wife Amanda she'd say sometimes it's <laughs> a challenge right yeah sometimes I have a hard time turning it off mm-hmm. but um, I've just always been that way hey, Justin's out of here uh, fighting over Monopoly yeah <laughs> right? I can't describe it but I can't describe why but I've always just liked to do it plus I'd say if you, when you find something that you're passionate about, mm-hmm. that you're also pretty good at, mm-hmm. right? Then it's like that takes the, you know, your competitiveness level and like magnifies it. Because mm-hmm. right? you're like, not only do I like it, I'm really good at that. And so you get this like feedback loop that's like you're having fun and you're also having success. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this is awesome. Right? Yeah. And you just want to do more and more and more and more. Yeah. So that's, that's really been, I was lucky enough to find that this job that I'm just perfect for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's probably just that loop that I'm in, right? Like, oh, this is so much fun. And look at all the success I'm having. And on and on and on, and on that happens. Mm-hmm. It just keeps me going. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. <laughs> <I'm real>. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about you have kids now, though. So how's that, like, yeah. how's that balance been? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it happened fast, right? So I, Three young children? Yeah, I've okay. got wow. uh, two girls and a boy. Um, I, have a, I have a six-year-old girl, Blair. My son, Jackson, is four. And I have a, my youngest daughter is Reese. She'll be two here in the next couple of months. Um, that changes everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Every, it's the cliche <laughs> thing, but everyone <laughs> always says it's like, that's the only way to describe it. It changes everything. It changes everything, right? It takes uh, your, pri- your priorities shift totally. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was all, you know, I like, I love being a dad. I love playing with them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, with like this morning, uh, you know, I didn't have much on my calendar this morning. So I was like, okay, well, I just blocked off my calendar until 10 a.m. Because I knew as soon as I get up, like they want to go out playing stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm going with them. Yeah, you know, right. We're have a blast. Right? <laughs> but the advantage is that they're little, so they don't last that long. Right. After like an hour or so, like they're pooped. Right? Yeah. So it's like, Helping out know, mom though. Yeah. Run right. them into the ground. Yeah. yeah. Right. Then you bring them in and then they're like ready for some chill time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, I mean, striking that balance is hard. Um, a lot of it's just priorities, right? Like you have to choose what's important to you. Mm-hmm. And one of the nice advantages of uh, like being my own boss, right, is that, you know, those are choices that I get to make. Mm-hmm. I don't have a boss who's breathing down my neck every day, like, you know, where's this, where's that, you know, why are you doing more of this? Or, as you know, like, you know, people who work from corporate America, sometimes, like, sometimes the, the game is to make it look, bu- like, make yourself look busy, right? Yeah. Yeah. You might not be producing or productive or effective at all, but, like, hey, you're there early and you leave late and you make it look good, right? Mm-hmm. 
But when you work for yourself, you don't have to do that. Right? Mm-hmm. You just have to be good, right? And I'm, you know, I'm accountable to my clients, but uh, guess what? Like they're all shoveling their driveways this morning too, right? So mm-hmm. they're not calling me. Um, but yeah, that's been a balance that at times has been hard to strike, but uh, was also one of the reasons why I chose in the industry the role that I have, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I mean, you can, there's a lot of different things you can do in working on Wall Street, right? But the financial advisor role probably grants you the greatest flexibility, right? Yeah. To create the work-life balance that you want rather than, you know, what your company wants, mm-hmm. right? But no, it's... It's been good. Yeah. Uh, it's tough at times, you know, but overall it's been pretty good. It's awesome. I, I mean, how much do you want me to talk about that? I don't know. No, I was just interested, you know. I mean, we're both young. Yeah, how much coffee do you drink to stay awake? <laughs> Not too bad. Not too much, you know. I'd say I go to bed early, right? Yeah. That's because I wake up early, too. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, are you tired? Yeah. But, I mean, you you get through it, right? You'll, you'll figure it out. It's really adapt and overcome at that point. You have three kids now, so you got to... Yeah. yeah, you can't return them. <laughs> yeah, right? you can't. There's no return policy. So they're here to stay. I'd say, you know, boundaries are really important, right? Um, so we've got boundary lines drawn where I work from about 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, with the exception of Tuesday night. So Tuesday night's like the only night that I work late because I host office hours in the evening because a lot of my clients work. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so it's pretty rare if I work another evening at, in addition to that or sometimes I'll trade a Tuesday for a Thursday to like accommodate a client or maybe something else is going on mm-hmm. but those are pretty much the boundary lines that, I, that were dra- have been drawn between me and my wife right where it's like okay everything that I need to get done that falls in like the world of work like these are the boundary lines that that's earmarked for mm-hmm. and anything outside of that would require like you know, us to have talk, have a conversation about, right? Um, but also, like, I'm pretty aware, too, of, like, well, every amount of time that I spend after that is time away from my other commitments that I've made, too, mm-hmm. right? And as you'll find, when you have little kids, like, little kids go to bed early, right? Yeah. Little kids go to bed, like, 7 o'clock. <laughs> Forget about that. Right. So, in a normal day, if I leave my office at 5, it's 5 minutes away, so I'm home at 5.05, I have less than two hours. You can't beat right? that commute. Like yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, right? so that's how you do it right there. Like, that's the big thing. Right? So I have like less than two hours with them in the evening, right? And an, at least an hour of that's eaten up just having dinner. Mm. Uh, and then maybe I've got 30 minutes or so in the morning before like we're all off in our directions. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that I was I'm present for as much as I can be. Mm. I just want to be, you know, a dad who's just there on the weekends, mm. right? So that was always something that's important to me, but you have to be intentional about it. Cause, right. You know, things just kind of keep creeping in, right? It's easy to it's easy to push out that time. It's a little more flexible, but yeah, maybe not what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard, right? Especially when you have like babies, and you know they're not happy. Right? <laughs> it's like so you go from like your your work day where like you're tired, and then you go home, and I start pretty much like my other full-time job which right. is like being a dad and husband right mm-hmm. so you have to kind of some days like you got to kind of dig deep to be like alright like I'm exhausted like when I go home I gotta you know yeah. give myself a little pep talk in the garage <laughs> yeah right before, come on right before he walks yeah. in the door he kicks yeah. off his shoes I'm like you got this <laughs> <laughs> alright so uh, let me transition here we're gonna get into uh, Justin's soapbox in a second but <laughs> if you stick around uh, you can hear uh, Justin's sports takes we're gonna get to that at the very end of the interview so stick around if you want to listen to that but first we're gonna get off in so this will be on youtube spotify apple everywhere um and hopefully forever it'll be up so if you had to listen <laughs> as long as we're abiding by the as, youtube as long, standards yeah, as long as we're doing everything yeah, right no pressure <laughs> <laughs> but uh if your kids someday listen to this or us or anyone getting the financial industry uh or not life advice what would you say is maybe your biggest accomplishment and how did you get there and what is your advice for someone who wants to achieve success like what you're doing? Like someone who's, you know, young and kind of fresh to the, to, to the working yeah. world. Yeah, like almost if you could go back and tell yourself one piece of advice, yeah. what would that be? Um, so, you know, I'd say it's kind of a strange thing because as a parent, you develop different advice. So I feel like as a, as a parent, like you give your kids advice that's, you know, in their best interest Mm-hmm. most of the time but you also uh, give them advice that is safe right mm-hmm. so I'd say you know looking back on it 
if it was my kids here, I'd say, hey, when you get out of college or whatever you choose to do after your high school, right? Um, that's a really unique time in your life where you get the chance to almost kind of take like maximum risk right? yeah. when it comes to your career, right? Take the risky, take the you know risky job that you might not think you're qualified for, and maybe you think you're biting off more than you can chew, but like you'll probably rise to the occasion. Yeah. Or you know, start if you want to start a business, like that's the time to do it because mm-hmm. you're low overhead. Right? Yeah, you don't have a mortgage, you don't have a family to pay for, right? You can afford to live cheaply, uh, and you don't have to have like you don't have to like not have family vacations because of it and stuff. Because down the road it gets hard, right? Yeah, down the road you have commitments and like you go start your business when you're forty years old and like you've got a lot of commitments already. That yeah, are kind yeah. of stopping a lot of people from taking that leap. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you're you're free to move anywhere, you're free to work anywhere, do anything. Like that's the time in your life to really uh, maximize that, like maximize your risk taking. Yeah. Because if it doesn't work out, there's always going to be jobs in corporate America, right, for you to do. Uh, trust me, they'll be thrilled to have you sit in a cubicle for the next thirty years, right? But I'm like. You know, in your tw- in your early twenties, it's a really unique time in your life to really take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd also say, like, as much as I'm as I would nudge that person to be like, you know, go after it. I'd be like, try and make sure you have that wrapped up, like by the time you're thirty, right? By the time you're thirty, yeah, you probably want to make sure that you got some of that stuff figured out, because right? mm-hmm. uh, you don't want to wait until you're forty or else you'll miss out on a whole another chapter of your yeah. life, which is like. You know, selling down, starting a family, if that's what you want, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Different wants. But I'd say, you know, your twenties are, are a really unique time, but don't don't turn your twenties make don't let your twenties last for twenty years, right? Yeah. But really, like from the get go, go for what you want. Mm-hmm. Right. Um spoken like a true financial planner. It's right gonna there. be scary one day when my kids, you know, probably are gonna pull this podcast up and be like, see dad, you said it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then we'll take right it down there. for that day. Right? <laughs> we'll get you out of yeah. it. Yeah. Be like, I know. But it becomes no longer accepted in society for you to eat ramen noodles <laughs> at 40. Yeah. It's yeah. no longer, unless it's, it's what you time. like, it's just for taste. But yeah. you're allowed to do these things, and society almost gives you permission to do certain things at 20 because mm-hmm. you're still figuring it out. Yeah. And that's why I like that piece of advice because at 40, people aren't going to be so excited about you maybe not bringing a gift to a Christmas party or something like yeah. that. You know, like where you still have permission right now to do that, but you won't. When you're 40. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a great piece of advice. It, if, if it comes to, you know, being a financial advisor, I'd say, hey, I encourage anybody that, you know, this is a fantastic career to get into, particularly when you're young. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel like a lot of times my, I feel like a lot of times my job gets overlooked, right? Because there's like other cooler jobs out there, right? Mm-hmm. Your financial advisor just doesn't have like the sizzle <laughs> that people are, are looking for. But I'm like, it's really a lot, there's really a lot more than meets the eye. Right? Mm-hmm. You get to kind of, you know, you're a professional, but you run your own business, right? You get to work directly with clients, and you get this, you know, create this, uh, you know, this balanced lifestyle to, right, to pursue the other things in your life that you like, uh, but still, you know, I don't think it's a very well kept secret. Like successful financial advisors can do pretty well financially too. Yeah. So, I'd say hey, we need more young, talented people in our industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you take a look at most financial advisors, they don't look like me, right? Yeah. Most of them are a lot older than me. And don't they say yeah. the, the average age of a financial advisor right now is 55? Totally, right? Wow. We've got a yeah. huge... It's the average age. We've got a huge industry issue where we've got a lot of financial advisors who are at or over retirement age. Um, and we don't have people to replace them. Yeah, that's right? crazy. Which is also, you know, for anyone listening, is a great opportunity for a young person right. to come in and be that you know, succession plan. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. It's, uh, but that's, I mean, it's a tough match to figure that out, but there's a lot of, going to be a lot, there's a lot of opportunity for that now. It's going to be even more in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just have a quick question we've been asking a lot of the people that have come on is, and you kind of expanded on this a little bit earlier, but how has this COVID situation affected your business? Maybe outside of the networking piece that you mentioned earlier, but mm-hmm. is there any other aspects that have been like really affected or? You know, I'd say early on it was kind of crazy right? mm-hmm. because, uh, when everything was exploding, right? It's funny enough. 
I was in, in I was in a in New York City the like last weekend in February, right? Pretty much like, yeah. it was right before New York City shut down for an investor conference, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a guy there who was like a PhD um, f- who covered China, right? And his whole hour long presentation was about the virus. And the summary of it was pretty much this this Wuhan flu thing. Since mm-hmm. they're going back now, this Wuhan th- flu thing. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's over. <laughs> it's gone. China's got this lockdown. The, the chart, chart after chart, presentation after presentation of how this is a non-issue. Don't worry about it. Wow. Everyone's moving on. It couldn't have been more wrong. It couldn't have been more wrong. Wham, right? They go to the show. That guy is not invited back next year. You're the smartest people in the room. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> might call it wrong, right? Wow. But uh, so then Jeez. we get back and they shut everything down. And of course, stock markets plummet. Mm-hmm. And people are, you know, I've, I've done a lot of coaching of my clients to right. expect this, right? But every time it happens, it, it's unprecedented, right? Mm-hmm. Because if Black it, swan event. Yeah, you, right? You taught me that, that term. Black swan <laughs> events. Everything, every time it happens, a black swan event, well, guess what? Like, the black swan events are kind of like their own category. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's why the market crashes. It's because no one knows what to expect, and everyone kind of has this in, innate human thing to be like, oh, let me grab all of my money, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But we've learned from that time and time again, and I've thankfully had coached clients right on what to do. I always had a plan for that. I had like my down market plan, and I'm grateful that I did because when it happened, I was able to kind of scale that up real quick. Mm-hmm. But I too saw, you know, my staff was concerned about their jobs, right? Because they're watching people who aren't essential, you know, uh, get furloughed, right? Mm-hmm. And they're asking me like, well, like, are you going to furlough us? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, no, that's not my plan, right? Um, gratefully, I'm in an industry that was considered essential, right? So we we're allowed to be open, yeah. right? But also, too, we charge mainly asset under management fees. We saw those decline pretty far, right. pretty fast. Yep. But we manage our costs pretty good. So a lot of our var- a lot of our variable costs are also based upon percentages. So gotcha. they flex with us, right? Okay. And uh, so that helps us maintain like the viability of kind of the whole financial, like firms and financial systems in general. Mm. But uh, we took a lot of steps, but then things came back really fast too. Yeah. And now they're better than they've ever been. Right. Which is kind of a strange uh, experience. But the hardest thing has probably just been the figure it out mentality that you have to adopt when it's like, okay, now everything's got to be done virtual. Now mm-hmm. the way that you've been doing everything now is different. Mm-hmm. And... We've been doing a lot of virtual meetings. It's how we do a lot of our internal stuff because, mm-hmm. you know, of course, our offices are kind of spread all over the country in a lot of different ways. So we have to do a lot of, like, you know, WebExes and virtual meetings. Yeah. But we weren't doing a lot of them with clients, particularly, like, clients over the age of 60. Right? Yeah. We weren't doing virtual meetings. We weren't doing signs. you know. Uh, so we had to totally change, like, the way that we were doing business with them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, problems that were simple, like getting something signed suddenly became hard right? yeah. yeah and so a lot of like kind of the figure it out and that's uh, something that i also you know, help my coach my staff with a lot too is that you know hey you know clients are coming to us because like they have something that needs to be figured out mm-hmm. and you know if we run into a few like obstacles we can't just be like oh well i guess it just can't happen yeah that's not the answer yeah. that we need the answer right. is like well we got to figure it out some way like get creative right? mm-hmm. get inside the box yeah um, so a lot of that is, which is figuring it out, and we're still figuring it out mm-hmm. um, because who, who knows how this changes the landscape of business forever. Right, and everyone's kind of that's kind of the one of the big topics up for the debate now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's been uh, probably our biggest change, and also too just navigating the interpersonal side of it, right? With just just this, you know. I don't want to get in a big COVID conversation, but God forbid, right? But you talk to 20 <laughs> different people and you get, you're going to hear 20 different game plans. Oh, 100%, yeah. And so you just want to be like respectful of everybody, but also like make sure that you're like protecting like your safety, your staff safety, but still running business. And it's a fine line that you have to walk to make sure that you don't want to offend people. Yeah. But you still have, like you still want to get 
the, the job done. It's a tough balancing act. Yeah. I find that that's been probably one of the hardest parts is just making people, making them like, sure that you're doing like your part to keep everyone safe but also making sure you're in pe- staying within other people's comfort zones yeah and working with like it's definitely sensitive yeah, yeah like where, where, where they coming from right? yeah because every everybody's idea of comfortable is completely different totally right yeah and, uh, so it's like okay we're, we'll we'll do it on their terms but um that every we got to problem solve differently for everybody for every single mm-hmm. scenario yeah. right yeah, yeah well and even for us, I mean, we were fist bumping you when you came in, and yeah. we were also like, "Is everyone comfortable without masks?" And mm-hmm. like, we take temperatures here when people come in, yeah. and we're discussing how we're going to do it for the upcoming tax season. Mm-hmm. We're leaning mostly on Zoom, but we yeah. don't know yet. So it's just really interesting. You see, even businesses that have taken this as like an opportunity to make like large scale changes. Like, mm-hmm. you see, Nationwide just removed pretty much every single like piece of real estate they own. They mm-hmm. they 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 only own like their corporate building. Every single other building, they're just Everyone now works for home if you work for Nationwide. And also just from employers going forward, I mean, we've got a lot of probably employer, small business owners mm-hmm. listening to this, this podcast. In the past, I mean, so our employees, like my employees didn't have work from home privileges, right? Mm-hmm. Now they do. Right. So it's like it just when you're looking to add have talent in your organization, uh, people are going to start pretty much demanding work from home mm-hmm. flexibility. Right. Mm-hmm. Companies are getting leaner, and also people are understanding that you don't have to compromise on quality just if people aren't there. Right. Which is, I think, that was always the concern: mm-hmm. is the quality of work will they be the same? Will we have the same responsiveness from our employees? But at this point, we're realizing that you don't have to compromise quality to in, to do this. What was really impressive was the degree to which technology technology adapted to the problems. Mm-hmm. Like it seemed like wherever there was cracks, technology was filling it in. Like yeah. as the problems were created, yeah. mm-hmm. super. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. The collaboration tools that exist now. You know, thinking about it, it's like we're we're almost blessed in a way that we we live in a special time. You know. It's it's the, one of the most peaceful and prosperous times that's ever existed in mm-hmm. all of human history, and then this wh- horrible virus comes. Mm-hmm. But we also live in the age of technology. Yeah, that makes it so much more doable. Yeah, right? and it's thank God for that. <laughs> I know. It's like, yeah, what would we do all day if we can, didn't have Netflix, or <laughs> Microsoft Teams? Like, how would we get yeah. by? Right? If, if this happened twenty five years ago, right? It would be a totally different situation. Oh, yeah. You, well, you wouldn't be able to do the things you're able to do. You wouldn't yeah. be able to tell people they have to stay home because yeah. businesses would not be able to survive. Now businesses are figuring out ways. That it's like, how, okay, well, like, and like you talked about, just this constant state of like, we just got to figure it out. Like That's one thing that to... I've be, been so amazed at businesses' ability to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, even small business owners, like they've gotten so creative in different yeah. ways to keep their businesses going. You know, as humans, we have this amazing ability to solve problems that are like mm-hmm. right in front of us. Yeah. Right? Um, but we're also like particularly bad at solving problems that are like five or even ten years down. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. That's why we need financial advisor. So I need a financial advisor <laughs> like Justin. He just sold it. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Justin, lay, us, lay it on us. I think I might have deduced what I think I figured. I think out I might too. have deduced, and I don't think we're going to be very happy. But um. You want to talk about football or all sports? Any sport. What are, what are your beliefs here, Justin? And are we going to end the podcast early or are we going to have a full talk about it? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how far we get. I'd say, where, so where where I, my allegiances lie is pretty strictly with the uh, Steelers and the Penguins, right? So it's, mm. I mean, you can take you can take the boy from Pittsburgh, but you can not take in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Um, but Steelers, I mean, I, I don't mind the Eagles. I have a friendly relationship with the Eagles. My mm-hmm. kids actually like the Eagles too, right? Because all their friends like the Eagles. There we go. So Good we got to get like comfortable with that, right? But uh, I will not. I will not be a Flyer fan under any circumstances. That's the, there's a hard line there. Um, hard line in the sand. But uh, you guys do have a basketball team, which is pretty cool, right? Yep. We don't have a basketball team, and I've definitely gotten you know more interested in that sport. I like the Phillies too. I don't like the Phillies. You know, the Pirates have always been kind of a, a, a underwhelming sports oh, yeah. franchise. This so. is where I always get at Pittsburgh sports fans because you always hear there's their Steelers and their Penguins. Yep. And then it's like, what about the Pirates? <laughs> it's like, it's like the Pirates have... were like a minor league team, <laughs> like in Pittsburgh. They're like, well, the Pirates, it's there. It's not. Who cares? <laughs> the nice part about the Pirates is that it's a cheap night out, right? I mean, you get a ticket. Yep. The stadium's awesome, right? But you get a ticket to a Pirate game for like twelve dollars, right? 
You know what I always think Pittsburgh's done well is they kept all their color schemes the same across their teams. Yeah. I think every city should do that. The black and gold. Yeah, that's how it should always work. I don't understand. I mean, it's great. You got all the whole color scheme for the city and everything. Yeah. It's the sports teams. Mm-hmm. I wish Philly did that. Like you got the the midnight green and the black with the Eagles, and then the Flyers are go orange and white. Yeah. And it's like, let's get something like same across. Some- I don't know if that was like by accident with this with Pittsburgh. I don't think it was. Though. I don't know. I mean. It's interesting that you say it because if you go to Pittsburgh and one of the always the fun part when up are traveling home is as soon as you get to like S- Somerset, right? Mm-hmm. You start seeing people with Steeler gear on, right? mm-hmm. or or just mm-hmm. black and gold in general. Because like you said, it could be any team, but all the colors are black and yeah, gold. Right. You start seeing black and gold at like the Turnpike rest stops, and then if you're in a city like Pittsburgh, especially if it's like a game day, it's like everyone's wearing black and gold. It's yeah. Like everywhere. Yeah. Right? So like, that's kind of one of the cool features of. Oh my gosh! Though. I grew up hating the Penguins. Yeah. I grew up hating Sidney <laughs> Crosby. The highlight, the highlight of my Steelers fandom was when Mike Richards opened up that playoff game, scored the goal, and then fought Sidney Crosby like three minutes into the game. Yeah. yeah. Got like the Gordy Howe within like five minutes of the game. Yeah. I mean, I think every hockey fan probably grew up hating Sidney Crosby though. So yeah. like, I don't think that's like particularly. We, we traded good. a decent amount of players though. Like some of our great players, like Yammer Yager, came to play for you guys. Yeah, we got him right? so washed though. He was like He's forty. That was still insane. When you had him and Lemieux at the same time we had one of our uh, Maxine Talbot right who was one of my favorite players and it was my really? favorite, favorite players because in, in that one playoff game where we ended up beating you guys you guys had us on the ropes right mm-hmm. and Maxine Talbot started a fight with one of your guys and got the crap kicked out of him right? Maxine Talbot got cra- the crap kicked out of him yeah he was always a good fighter too that's he's surprising he's yeah. he's not very big yeah. Yeah. yeah so when he picked that fight and they got engaged and like Maxine Talbot just went crazy right yeah and even though he still lost as they were kicking him out, he was like waving all the Flyers fans, yeah. and, like booing him. Yeah. But that like that turned the whole energy of the game around. Sometimes that's how you do it, though. You yeah. end up with that's, that's what like those like scrappy guys do. I like yeah. Talbot too. He's, he was always for, he would to play for you guys. Too. Yeah, he always uh, he stretches the rules a little bit though. Yeah, he like if the team's down, like he'll run somebody through the boards. That's yeah. a Maxine <laughs> Talbot move. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like. Um, I didn't like Crystal Tang. Oh, he's one of my favorites too. Yeah. Oh, he's a great goal scorer for a defenseman, but I hated him too. But yeah, Cri- Crosby and Malkin were the, <laughs> the guys that just always got in risky. I mean, obviously, the, the guys putting the puck in the net. Exactly. Right? Yeah, right. That's why I don't like him. I mean, but. I might bleep this part out, but um, my favorite <laughs> player growing up, regardless of any team, well, one of my favorite players, was Troy Palomalu. I oh, yeah. loved him. I don't know what it really? I just. His the way he was able to predict plays like you know that play like you, everyone can yeah. see it in their head right now if you're a football fan like you saw him jump over that line that was like his move like Fine. you can like just the way he played the game I thought was amazing I loved watching him play although I didn't like the Steelers it was maybe it was his hair Justin I don't know what to tell you he's also a really good guy too, yeah right? so that's, he's also a really good person so everyone in the city really loved Troy he was very generous right mm-hmm. he was always like you know doing stuff for kids and he was just a generally nice generally nice guy yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Which is nice. I mean, we went through a run in Pittsburgh just a year or two ago where we had some people who like weren't really that great guys. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. You definitely, it's better to have like James like, James Harrison people. is a demon. That yeah. guy is, is the human embodiment of a demon. That guy is insane. Yeah. Could you? I couldn't imagine being on a field with him where he could inflict bodily harm on me. <laughs> I wouldn't even touch the football. <laughs> you, you ever see the videos of him working out? Unbelievable. They're like crazy. He's like picking up a car. Yeah. He's a freak. It's like, for what reason are you going to pick up this He's guy? like 50, and he's like bench pressing like 400 pounds. I know. He's like an he retired, and he came back. Yeah. There's still a, taking people's heads off. There's a video like, I'll show you maybe after this where team, like, someone ran on the field and was like, a uh, spectator was like celebrating. Oh, the God. Field, and uh, James Harrison just picked him up and bodied him. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine looking up and yeah. James Harrison. He's, he's, he's airborne. Yeah. You yeah. couldn't pay me to get hit by James Harrison. I know, no. right? <laughs> They'd be paying you to die. Yeah. I would, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to do that. But Palomalu, I always liked him as a as a guy. Yeah. But the, the only reason I didn't love him was because it was always the debate of who the best safety in football was, and it was always like him, Dawkins, Ed Reed. Yeah. And it was like I was all, obviously I'm always going to say Dawkins, and yeah. so it was like always that like contest, and especially with him being in state. And the, growing up, the Steelers were so much better than the Eagles. The Steelers were winning Super Bowls, and the mm-hmm. Eagles were, like, barely winning, like, NFC East titles. Oh, we got one. Yeah. yeah. So you had, like, the kids in class, and they were like, they were the Steelers fans. We're going to the Super Bowl. We're going to the Super Bowl. It was cool, <laughs> it was cool to see how, the, how excited the city got when the Eagles were in the Super Bowl and won the mm-hmm. Super Bowl. Because, I mean, I don't have anything to go against the Eagles. We almost never right. play each other. No, yeah. never. So it's, you know, seeing everyone so excited, I was like, oh, this is a, that's kind of cool. 
Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm happy, happy for you. Yeah. Were you in Pittsburgh when you guys won some Super Bowls? Yeah. So I was in when we won. Uh, so we actually won the Super Bowl my freshman year in college and my senior year. That must have been right? awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> actually, this my senior year in college was the year that we won the Super Bowl and the Stanley Cup in the same year. Oh my god. So that that must have been electric. That year was yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's so awesome. I go to St. or went to St. Joe's, just graduated, but it, I was there too when the Eagles won. And it was just a, it's like an aura or an electric feeling in yeah. the city when your team is winning at the highest stage. It's like yeah. unlike anything else. Unfortunately, I was in South Carolina when we won a Super Bowl and people down there could not care less. <laughs> yeah. He so missed the parade and everything. Yeah, I was just, I was just the, a, within a group of like 35 people yeah. and they were like, who are these psychopaths? Why are they here? <laughs> <laughs> Steeler fans have been pretty excited, it's, except for as of late. We have mm-hmm. two games in a row. We're on a, a little slide. winning streak, right? We were all excited, like, are we going to go undefeated? Losing <laughs> Bud was a big loss for you guys, I think. Yeah. Bud and Devin Bush. Yeah. Bud Dupree and Devin Bush, those are two, two electric players. I love Devin Bush in Michigan. Mm-hmm. I wanted him so bad on the Eagles. We have, we have negative linebackers. We don't even have a linebacker that does anything positive. They go out there and they create plays for the other team. Yeah. <laughs> I love Devin Bush in Michigan. <laughs> We that de- we definitely develop a great linebacker squad all the time. And mm-hmm. so we do, do a great job developing receivers too. Oh, unbelievable! Me, and my, me, and my I will talk to my dad about it all the time. Like we just need to cut everyone on our team and just take the guys off the practice squad for the Steelers. I guarantee you they're better. <laughs> like Chase Claypool, you yeah. pull this guy out of nowhere. Where he looks like he's Randy from? Moss. It's like where did this guy come from? Yeah, he's like fifteenth really receiver selected. But Steelers do an unbelievable job. I don't know. I'm probably more envious than I am disliking of the Steelers. It's yeah. almost you know being growing up a Steelers fan your whole life. You're almost spoiled by by having this great franchise. Mm. That's, That's how I feel about the Patriots. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. If, if you're a kid in Boston in the past ten oh. years, you think that this is just the way it is. You don't even know what losing feels like. Yeah. Right. You're like oh my god, I can't believe we got bounced in the second round of the playoffs this year. Like, it's a bad year. <laughs> right. It's like you know the Eagles are like, we please just win the division. Yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> but you know we got the Super Bowl. We've been good lately, so can't mm-hmm. complain. Actually, for our lifetime, we haven't been bad. It's just you compare yourselves to the teams around you. The teams yeah. around us have been successful, so mm-hmm. it is what it is. I don't know. Yeah. I'm done with my rant. Sorry. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I guess we could talk. We could talk about this for forever, but yeah. I think we're gonna wrap it up uh, right now. Are we all good? I'm great. All right, Justin. So if you want to let everyone know where they could. Maybe get in contact with you if we're allowed to do that. Oh, yeah, sure. So you can probably, the easiest way is just to re- reach me on my website. If you just Google my name, right? Mm-hmm. The only Justin Bartolomucci that's like around. Uh, so you spell my last name, B-A-R-T-O-L-O, M is in mother, U-C-C-I. And if you just Google Justin Bartolomucci, you'll get hit my Edward Jones landing page or one of my social sites. And mm-hmm. You'll be able to contact me through that. It goes right to me. Fantastic. Cool. I practiced my spelling of his last name before the episode. So yeah, I appreciate it. In case that. I had to do it. <laughs> All right, guys. This is a fun idea. I'm really glad you guys brought yeah. me on. I'm excited for uh, to watch your podcast grow. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be great. Thanks Justin, for thank you on. so much for coming on. We're learning so much through this process, and we just can't be more grateful for everyone who chooses to come on. So yeah, thank seriously. you so much. You want to wrap it up? Yeah, sure. Justin, thank you for your time. We know you're a busy guy. Uh, Got 160 clients to worry about. Hopefully 200 here soon. Uh, You can reach us at The Small Business Experience. That's LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Music. Pretty much anywhere you can listen to anything. Um, That's Justin Bartolucci, Dan Trout. See you later, guys. See you later. Thanks for watching. Bye.